All right, let's assume the position. This week I have preached in Jackson, Mississippi and Tampa, Florida. And we did this in both of those cities. I do it every Sunday morning. Guests, y'all bear with us. Lean forward in your seat. All right? Your hands are out here in front of you. Your eyes are big. Your mouth is wide open. I'm going to count down to three. When I get to three, throw your hands high in the air and shout, wow. You ready? Here we go. Are you ready? I can wait on you to get ready. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Man, don't you feel better? Don't you feel younger? Let's do it again, all right? You ready? Lean forward in your seat. One, two, three. One of these days, we're going to do it section by section. And we're going to see how fast we can do the wave. I said that two or three weeks ago, and some of our youth come up to me and said, Pastor, that's old school. Wave is old. You got to catch up. Well, I'm trying, but I don't know what took its place. Come on, one more time. Throw your hands up. All right, all right, all right. We're happy for all of our guests that are here today. We are so thrilled that you came out today to be with us. If you're here with your family, we love your family. And your family loves this church. If you're here with friends, we love your friends. And your friends love this church. And so we love you. And we are wanting you to fall in love with Dallas First Church. Would you stand with me? I know the hour is late. And I am not going to keep us very long. I have an airplane to catch in just a few moments. And I'll be flying down to Houston where I'm ministering tonight and then again tomorrow night. But uh, I told my wife we'll celebrate Mother's Day on Thursday of this week. Hallelujah. So, all right, I am looking at 1 John chapter 15 and verse 13. My message today is simply entitled, Don't Look in the Mirror. Verse 13 first, or of John 15, says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now I know it says a man, but it's also meaning for a woman. It's for anyone. There's no greater love than when we would lay down our life for a friend. My message today is simply don't look in the mirror. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Bless our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. amen. Bless you. You may be seated. When I was born, five minutes after I came into the world, my brother arrived, my twin. We were mirror twins. We were identical, except I was left-handed, he was right-handed, so it was like we looked in a mirror. And he was a piece of work. He had an awesome personality. He always had a smile on his face bigger than Texas. And you can take the boy out of Texas, but you could not take Texas out of the boy. He lived in California, but he wore the big 10-gallon hat. He would not dress in a suit. He would wear his Wranglers and his boots his satellite belt buckle. And for him to dress up, it would be that he had a silk 
scarf. He called it a rag. He said, you guys from the city call it scarf. He called it a silk rag that he tied around his neck. He was standing in San Francisco on the street with the crowd when President George W. Bush came by in the motorcade. And my twin was standing there in his full cowboy outfit. He trained horses. And so there he was standing there right in the front in all of those fruits and nuts from California. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend anybody. Well, I, well, let's move on. He's standing there. And the motorcade comes by, all the police officers, all of the SUVs, those black ones. And, uh, and then finally, here comes the presidential limo. And George W. Bush is in it. And my twin is standing there. And you also have to remember, he was a University of Texas Longhorn football fanatic. And so he's standing there, and when the president rolls by, he tips his hat at him, and then he gave him the hook em horns. And the presidential limo screeched to a stop. It backed up until it was right in front of my twin. And the back window rolls down. And George W. Bush put his head out the window and said, Howdy, Tex. <laughs> and my twin never missed a beat. He said, Howdy back at you, Mr. President. <laughs> and then he called me that night. And he said, Tom. You pastor that big church in Dallas. He said, does the president know your name? <laughs> he said he stopped his limo right in the middle of the procession and called me text. <laughs> that was what my mama produced. Influence. Influence is everything. The greater your influence, the greater your effectiveness in this world. The more you influence, the more effective you're going to be. A mother's influence is felt from the cradle to the grave. You can never outrun it. You can't hide from it. So you might as well embrace it. Influence. So wherever you are, whoever you are, you do have influence. That's what I'm talking about today. It's influence. We come face to face with the true nature of leadership. It's when we exert our influence. Or maybe we fail to influence. See, the position is not enough. There's a lot of women that have given birth to babies and it made them a mother. But the position of mother does not mean you're going to use that influence to produce an awesome human being. Because there have been many who would not use their influence for the good. And we've seen the reaping of the whirlwind. But I'm not focusing on the negative today. 
I'm focusing on the positive. Use your influence. My mother took time with us for prayer every day, for scripture every day. By the time we got to Sunday school, and this started about the time I was nine years old, and it went till I was 15. From nine to 15, every Sunday on our way to church, we had to quote three, at least three verses of scripture that we had memorized that week. Mama was tough. Oh, she was there. She was kind. She was nice. She was loving. I had climbed a tree when I was about, uh, I guess, 10 or 11. And somehow a knot in the tree had caught on my pants leg. And when I tried to come down, it hung up. And in all of my twisting and in all my turning, it just got all that much more hung. And there I was. And in my little brain, I couldn't get free. And all these people were walking by. It was a busy place. And there I was with my legs hanging down. I was about six foot at eight years old anyway. <laughs> and I'm in the tree and I'm hung and I can't get out. And the more I twist and the more I turn, the more stuck I am. And so people are walking by and they stop. And back then I was called Tommy and everybody in the neighborhood knew me as Tommy. Tommy, do you need help? And I'm embarrassed to say, yeah, I got a hole in my pants and somehow I'm hung up in this tree. And I'd say, no, I'm fine. <laughs> and someone else come by, Tommy, do you need help? I don't know how they could tell I needed help. Maybe it was the look on my face. I mean, I was horrified. I was scared to death. I just knew I was going to be there for the rest of my life. And the sun set and it got dark. And I remember people walked by, and in my little brain, I thought, oh, the priest walked by the man on the Jericho Road, and the Levite walked by, but where's the Good Samaritan? And about 8.30 that night, I heard her voice, Tommy! It was Mama. Because Timmy had already made it home. Debbie had already made it home. Mark, he was already there. But there was one missing. And it wasn't my dad that came looking. It wasn't my brothers or my sister. But it was my mom. And she came. And I forgot all about being scared. I forgot about being afraid. And I just hollered out, Mama! And doors flew open in the neighborhood. <laughs> Windows were raised. And people, I thought you didn't need any help. I didn't care. I was crying. I was screaming. My little legs were just uh, kicking. And Mama showed up. To this day, I don't know how she got that ladder. I don't know how she had that pair of scissors. Somehow it must have been a cartoon figure. You know, that was mama. She must have, boom, and a, she just produced it. And there it was. And she climbed that tree, not the way I did, but with a, a ladder. She stood there and had me raise myself up, move myself around to where she could cut me free. And I never was so happy in all my life to know mama. But she's always told me, you're going to make it. You're going to do a work for God. You're going to be a success. You're going to be all right. 
And I remember when everything was going wrong and I'm in college and it just looked like it was over with. I mean, final weeks. And, uh, and she just kept saying, you're going to make it. Everything's going to be all right. You're going to get through this. You're going to look back at this as a piece of cake. And her influence was always there. I remember when she told me, you better not let Gayla Hayden get away from you. I remember after we got married, been married for a few years, she told me. She said, now look, I'm on Gayla's side. She said, if y'all have problems, don't even bother telling me because I'm going to be on her side. I told you mama had influence. And so who I'm today is due to a lot to my mom and her influence. She did not just carry the position of mother. She went further. And her influence is still going on today. And so, with a positive narrative like that, I want to urge everyone here today, not just mothers, not just fathers, but singles and children and young adults. We must get to the point to where we exert influence. Now, earlier I was talking about my twin brother. He was such a guy, I said at his funeral, Tim never met a mirror that he didn't like. He never saw a camera that he turned down. In fact, if you were just walking by with a camera, he'd stop you and say, you want to take my picture? <laughs> and so Tim, I mean, he'd, he'd turn that mirror and he'd cock that head and that hat, and he'd say, you're looking good, cowboy. <laughs> and so we'd be riding the horse. And he'd be out in front of me, and he'd turn back and look at me, and he'd say, boy, you set that saddle good, cowboy. And I'd look back at him, and I'd say, uh-huh, I know what you're wanting. You're fishing. You want me to tell you you look good in that saddle, cowboy. Now, that's just how he was. But that's not how he lived his life. He lived his life by giving to others. He served others. He was a teacher. And so he would teach. But he didn't just teach in any school. He volunteered to go to the alternative school. He wanted to take those that were down and out. And he would use that influence. He wanted to go to those that didn't have a good chance. And in fact, that's how he lost his life. He died on June the 3rd, 2009. On June the 1st, which was our birthday, he arrived at the Vision Quest Ranch in Southern Arizona. He'd come from California, and he was there for a month. He was out of school, so he's going to spend a month on that ranch. And he would train horses early in the morning, and then train them in the late afternoon and the early evening. In the hours in between, he was going to teach school, because this ranch was where they sentenced gang members in junior high and high school from Los Angeles. And they had to go there to spend three years, and so school went year-round. So he would go in June and give two teachers each a two-week vacation. And so that's what he was there for. And so he was 
giving, his influence, his time, his effort. It was always spent after others. And so when I say don't look in a mirror, I'm not trying to cast that my brother used his influence in a negative way. He loved mirrors. He would look in them. He liked what he saw. But he didn't live his life that way. But there's too many people that live their life always looking in the mirror. What do you mean? They're about themselves. They're about who they are. They're about what they want. They're about my way. They may have others they need to be influencing, but they're too busy looking at what they want. They're too busy looking at who they are and where they are going. We've got to get the big picture. And that is that the whole world is made up of other people. And as soon as it dawns on us that our life is not revolving around who we are. But if we will look at others and live for others. I've never met anyone that truly wins with other people who's not mastered the ability to serve others with dignity. I want our young people. I want our young adults our mothers and fathers, our children to learn that to be selfish in our living is a unpositive attitude and attribute. But what we should do is realize the positive quality of unselfishness, to change our behavior, to get in the habit of focusing on others. On others. Before we make our lunch, make their lunch. Before we serve ourselves, serve them. You want to make it in this world? You want to be a success in whatever arena you find yourself? Serve others. Care about others. Take time with others. You're not going to make it when you're all wrapped up in yourself. And really, that's a very small package. That one didn't go over too well. See, when you focus on others, you give yourself purpose. You find purpose in living. Success in life has nothing to do with what you gain in life or what you accomplish in life. But it's all in what you've done for others. When a preacher is speaking over your casket, yes, he'll talk about or she will talk about all you've done and what this and that but the main thing is what you've done for others how you cared for other people it'll give you purpose it will give you energy energy somebody shout energy Energy. I have found the more I do for others the more energized I feel when I'm doing it all for myself Before long, you're wore out. Now, I'm telling you, you do for others, yeah, you're going to get tired. And sometimes it will frustrate you. You're going to be giving and giving and giving. But when you lay down at night and you survey your day and how you've made others feel better about themselves, Man, I come walking into the office today, and the first person I saw was Matt. Now, y'all know Matt. Tall, lanky Matt. No hair on his head, but he's got it around his chin. And Matt met me. His eyes were dancing. His hands were up. He was alive. And he said, 
You're the main man in the world. And I stopped. And I realized what I was going to preach today. And I went, bingo. There is my illustration. It's Matt Parrish. Every time you see him, he's making people happy. Every time you see him, he's enthusiastic about meeting you. Have you ever seen people walk in a room and they go, Hello room, I'm here. Or have you seen people walk into a room and they go, There y'all are. I've been looking for y'all. Now which one are you going to warm up to the quickest? Come on, somebody. Be energized in Jesus Christ. Yeah, when you're giving yourself to others, it's going to give you a contentment. Watch this. If you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, go do your hobby. Go shopping. That's going to make you happy for a day. And all the men said, yes. Go fishing. Go golfing. Go ride the horse. If you want happiness for a month, now watch this, all you single people. If you want happy, happiness for a month, get married. That's why I keep re-upping every month. <laughs> Said our newlyweds, the Philip Spellman family. If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. Win the lottery. Boy, some of y'all are right now going, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, no. I, I'm playing that scratch-off, man. I'm out here to get that. Oh, it'll... One year. If you want happiness for a lifetime, help others. Invest in others. Invest in them. If you want happiness for a lifetime, listen, you actually help yourself when you're helping others you can take your eyes off the mirror by helping others reaching for others so let's find happiness not by tending our needs first but helping others what can I do to forget myself and focus on others? You set your needs aside and do something for someone else today. So, what are we going to do today? Why don't we today be specific in helping somebody else? That's what Jesus did. He didn't have to come. He was God Almighty, creator of the universe. What's man doing? Just let him do his thing. But no, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It, he wasn't worried about the cross, the crucifixion, the pain, the suffering. He wasn't looking in a mirror. But Hebrews tells us, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. That was for you. That was for me. As our heads are bowed and the eyes are closed, and we've come here to the end. Please, I don't want any more moving around. We've had a lot of that today. No one else moving around. I know the hour's late. And we've got dinner reservations and places to go.
But right now it's so important. Because somebody here today is hurting. You have a dream that has not come true. You have needs that have not been met. You have hurts that need healing. Well, Jesus Christ came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. And he's here today to take care of your need. In just a few moments, we'll be leaving the building. But for right now, whatever your need is, whatever your hurt is, whatever your broken dream is, bring it to Jesus. Bring it to the front. Deacons and elders and prayer teams are coming here now. And we want to meet with you and pray with you. And as you bring that hurt, you bring that need to Jesus. You humble yourself before God. The Bible simply says to repent of your sins. To be washed in baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So as we stand here in the building, whatever your need is, whatever your hurt is, whatever the dream that you have, I want you to bring it. There'll be, you won't be coming by yourself. There'll be others coming. So whatever it is, would you step out and come? I see folks coming already right now, coming to Jesus. Just come here. Come up to one of these that are here in this altar that want to pray with you. Just step up to them. Don't just hold back. Come on up. Tell them what your hurt is. Tell them what your need is. Come to Jesus right now. Come to Jesus. He's here to help you. He's here to minister to you. He'll cover your shame. He can meet your need. He can raise you up in power. And in glory. As they begin to play and sing here right now. God is our help. Ever present help in time of trouble. Come to Jesus. I see two families here already. I see three singles here already. I see those here right now in need. Coming to Jesus. Just raise your hands and talk to Him right now. We give you glory in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You haven't come. There's still room.